Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the organizers for having me. It's been a really great workshop. Um, really enjoyed it so far. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, this system. Okay, so just plain old monolayer graphene uh, that is sandwiched between two boron nitride layers. And um, if I define the twist angles as theta bottom and theta top, um, I'm going to try to answer the questions or an really ask questions about um, what happens at these special alignment configurations when I'm either at both zero or zero and 60, um, because they should have unique properties because of these uh, threefold symmetry of the boron nitride. And what happens uh, at a slight misalignment, so I don't know, per perhaps you know, when I have two overlapping uh, more super lattices, how, does the, uh, how do the properties evolve? And so to motivate and sort of help us understand what's going on, I'm gonna be spending some time to um, report on results of my predecessors. So um, Rebecca and Julia uh, developed this device platform, which they called Twistable Electronics, um, which I think was coined after the Twistronics uh, uh, yeah, um, label. Um, but in their system, they basically they use a, an atomic force <laughs> microscope to rotate uh, a piece of boron nitride on top of a graphene hall bar, and then they can do all sorts of measurements in a single device uh, where they study the properties as they evolve as a function of a twist, twist angle. And um, in this device, uh, they were careful to not align the graphene to the bottom boron nitride. So they can bring the system into total misalignment and then uh, single alignment. So just one BN and graphene being aligned. Okay, and then <coughs> the remainder of the talk, I will spend talking about this, you know, trying to answer these questions. Um, and it, uh, we recently uh, published a paper on this, uh, which appeared in the print issue, uh, the November print issue of Na Nature Nanotech. Okay, so just a little background to remind ourselves. So uh, here we have graphene, uh, which is not aligned, and you get these uh, six Dirac cones with linear dispersions. Um, and if you do a... Uh, field effect uh, transistor measurement <coughs> where you sweep um, a gate voltage and then you therefore you know, adjust the density and you can sample different um, Fermi levels inside <coughs> of this fan diagram. When you tune through zero density, you see this peak in the resistance because there's no states at that point. And the reason this isn't an infinite uh, you know, direct delta point here is because the Fermi level is actually kind of um, you know, a little wider because we have thermal activation at finite temperature. And if you take uh, graphene and align it to boron nitride <coughs> uh, due to you know, this long, uh, you know, long wavelength varying super lattice and the additional zone folding that you get, as well as some symmetry breaking, you get uh, the production of these special uh, <coughs> secondary direct points. And now we actually have gaps um, at all the previously protected direct crossings. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to label these two special points um, as the primary direct point and the secondary direct point. And you can do this same measurement uh, where you build, build a field effect transistor device and then you sweep the field and you can actually sample the other direct points and see a second peak up here. Um, okay. So then the other important probe that we have is, you know, we can adjust the angle of the, uh, of the two crystals and that changes the Moray wavelength. Okay, which is um, you know, determined by this dispersion here, uh, where at only small angles do we see a significant rise in the um, Moray wavelength. And in transport, um, we actually have uh, some very simple you know, algebra to do uh, when we take our measurement to actually understand what this wavelength is. And we can determine the angle to within an accuracy of about 0.1 uh, degrees using this technique. Uh, and it gets even better when we go to uh, low temperature when the, uh, the broadening of these peaks isn't as high. Okay, and then another important detail of this, of course, is that we, um, we actually are going to break the sublattice symmetry of the graphene because the, uh, you know, while graphene is uh, D6H uh, symmetric, uh, boron nitride is D3H. Uh, and so the graphene actually sort of inherits the symmetry of the boron nitride. And the overall super lattice also, you know, has the same symmetry as the boron nitride. Um, and <coughs> uh, there was some experimental work where they actually measured um, the uh, activation gaps as a function of this Moray wavelength, and they find that you know, as you uh, align the crystals more and more, uh, the gaps seem to open up more and more. And in order to take this data, they had to make several different devices. Um, and basically, you know, they twist into random, random angles, measure what the angle is, and then measure the gap and generate this plot. Okay. Sure. The secondary direct point 
Oh, it's. Uh, That's coming from the, from the substrate, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So basically, um, you can think of this. You know, we have now this much larger effective Brillouin zone. Okay, that appears, and so um, in K space, it's going to have a very short little uh, wave vector. Okay, that describes this this little more unit cell, and so you need. I think you need like 57 of those, you know, in order to span the entire, you know, uh, space of the graphene unit cell. I might be pushing this a little bit, but you know, basically, you know, zone folding should effectively produce that the presence of these. Uh, and if anybody, you know, has a better idea about that, they could <laughs> please interrupt. Um, and okay, so. Uh, the other important thing that happens in this system is, you know, when we do get close to alignment, you know, this rigid lattice picture is actually no longer correct. Um, the graphene does preferentially sort of stretch uh, so that it can find these low energy stacking configurations. And so this commensurate incommensurate condi uh, condition was observed. And here we have some conductive AFM uh, and Young's modulus mapping uh, scans where they actually show that, you know, we have three distinct colors here. We have these like bright spots, a uh, big dark spot, and then sort of an intermediate spot. So these are three-fold rotationally symmetric. Um, now, okay. And they're also the important features that, you know, the sizes of these different domains is, is now different. Okay, so now we have some stretching of these domains. Okay. And, you know, there are, there are theoretical explanations that actually say, okay, as a result of this uh, stretching, we actually get, you know, we, of course we have in-plane strain, but we also have uh, now variations in the uh, separation of the layers. So there's these two competing effects which, you know, will affect the coupling um, between the layers and therefore will affect to what degree the BN can break the sublattice symmetry of the graphene. Uh, but overall, uh, you know, they definitely play a role in the production of the gaps. And uh, there's some experimental work, at least uh, for this layer separation question, where they, uh, they basically use pressure to squeeze one of these stacks uh, that are close to alignment, and by closing that layer separation, um, they can also increase uh, the size of the gaps. So, you know, experimentally and, and theoretically, uh, you know, the driving principle behind all of it is that I break the sublattice symmetry of the graphene, and I can tune that by, you know, controlling the separation as well as the, um, the strain. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned that in this device, we, or, you know, for these results, I had to make multiple devices. Uh, of course, wouldn't it be great if you had a single device where you could measure multiple twist angles? And okay, that's what Rebecca and Julia did. Uh, and then before then, Rebecca and Tarun did this device where they were studying contact resistance between graphite and graphene as a function of twist angle. So some of the kinks got worked out in this project. And so this is kind of the evolution. And, you know, just to, uh, illustrate this a little bit, the way this works in practice is I bring my FM tip in contact mode to the, uh, the rotator piece and then I can just slide it to different angles um, when it is atop this hall bar. And this animation that I showed at the beginning of the talk, this is uh, just a sequence of scans that I've strung together as an animation. And just as an aside, you can see, you know, these little globs, this is just residue, maybe, you know, a bit of moisture, a bit of tape residue, leftover polymer residue from the processes. And you can see that this acts as kind of like a little mini, like, Roomba or Zamboni <laughs> thing that will clean up my sample. Um, so we've observed things like, you know, if you have a bubble between your rotator and your, uh, the, su the substrate that you're sliding on, this will also expel the bubble. So it's kind of a self-cleaning process. Um, yeah. Okay, so <coughs> now I'm going to summarize some of the results from, uh, you know, the predecessor paper. So this is graphene misaligned to bottom BN. Okay, and so first off, we see uh, some broadening in the 2D uh, graphene Raman, Raman peak, which we sort of have hand-wavingly attribute to um, inhomogeneity in the, uh, the, the in the strain distribution due to the lattice relaxations. And so, you know, as you go closer to alignment, the crystal will stretch, and you know, it'll be under some, both tensile and compressive strain in different places, and this ends up broadening its 2D peak. And so, as you if you plot that as a function of angle near um, or you, you plot the full width half max as a function of angle uh, near zero degrees, uh, you see that it peaks. Okay, and if you plot that full width half max as a function of the wavelength, um, you had, they, they got a result that is in pretty good agreement with a previous paper. Uh, and for this one, uh, they had to make several different devices and measure the full width half max of each. 
Um, and it should be pointed out, you know, just experimentally, there's a little bit more scatter here because substrate, substrate effects do matter um, for this measurement than many others. And so if you have just one device, whatever the conditions are that you started with, you know, as long as no disasters come your way, uh, you, you know, it should, the experimental conditions should be the same. <coughs> uh, you can also do friction measurements with your AFM. So, you know, by looking at the torsion uh, of your cantilever as you drag the tip across sporin nitride, the degree to which the, uh, the laser deflects on your photo detector um, is basically a readout of what the lateral force is. And so, as you drag this tip uh, through your rotator um, over, you know, so, you know, if it's in motion, you, this is kinetic friction you're measuring, uh, you see peaks that are roughly separated by 60 degrees. And the fact that these peaks are not the same, I, I, I believe, you know, it's just an artifact of just the overall geometry of the tip, you know. Could be that the, no, the force that you're pushing on one of the arms of that gear is kind of changing angle with respect to the gear. So you might not read out the same force. Uh, we do see things, so this is just a, uh, like a time domain picture of what the friction looks like. Uh, you know, your intuition about how friction works actually still applies down at this scale. Uh, you can see that, you know, as the tip drags along the surface, you have some constant um, kinetic friction that's, you know, just characteristic of the tip substrate interaction. But then once you hit the rotator, you get a rise in friction as the rotator, you know, resists motion. And then, you know, it kind of unsticks and then you get a kinetic friction mode again. And uh, if you're close to alignment, um, because of, you know, the graphene is trying to seek these um, low energy stacking configurations, you're going to get this stick slip phenomena as well. And, you know, if this is well controlled, perhaps you could, um, you know, measure, if you, if you understood the distance over which you were sliding, you could, you could say something about, you know, the length scales of how that stick slip propagates. Okay. Um, so for this transport measurement, so the field effect uh, measurement, uh, you still see the primary Dirac point and the secondary Dirac point. And as you change the twist angle, uh, the position of that secondary Dirac point changes because the size of your um, Mori unit cell is changing. Okay, so this, uh, this separation, you know, between these two peaks is basically uh, measuring how, yeah, it's basically just a measure of, of, of the Mori wavelength. Okay, and so here if you plot, uh, if you use those expressions that I put on the slide earlier, um, you can verify that the dispersion matches uh, between wavelength, angle, and, you know, this uh, separation between the peaks. Okay, and then they can also, you can also do thermal activation measurements. So you can uh, do this same, you know, basically plot what is, the, what is the resistance of this peak. I think this is, you know, in this next slide, this is the satellite peak. So what is the resistance of the satellite peak? as a function of temperature, okay, and then you do an Arrhenius fit to this, uh, and the slope of that Arrhenius fit can tell you what the thermal activation gap is. And so we actually see that this, you know, for the secondary Dirac point, it's pretty well behaved. We get a drop off uh, away from alignment, um, but the primary Dirac point uh, shows what looks like scatter, and actually the, the, um, the gap survives uh, at fairly large twist angle. Okay, which, you know, should be beyond the, the, you know, the twist at which these lattice relaxations are supposed to happen. So perhaps, you know, this effect, you know, might, you know, the, the, uh, the production of the gap at the PDP might not only do, be due to these lattice relaxations. Um, and these are also repeatable. So they actually, uh, they went back and so they twisted away, they twisted back and they measured around the same angle. So it looks like scatter, but it's, it's actually repeatable. Okay, so that's what we need to know about the single line case, now the double line case. So, you know, I take a, my other layer of boron, I align the graphene to the first boron nitride, and then I twist the next layer of boron nitride. And we see that there are two coexisting Moray patterns. And um, we can uh, now tune these two Moray patterns so that they, you know, they sort of perfectly add or perfectly cancel. And so we can ask the question, what happens to zero and 60 degrees again? And then what about slide misalignment? So what happens when we have coexisting morays or super morays? Okay, so in our sample, I've aligned the graphene to the bottom boron nitride. And when I was doing this, um, the way I would do it is I would just make a bunch of samples and then measure with Raman and screen them for which ones were aligned. And uh, you know, that's very painstaking. We now have a technique where we can align it every time, but it's too late because <laughs> the paper's done. Uh, so we have to think of other things to do with this. Uh, but 
I add the rotator on top, and now because the bottom is at zero degrees, uh, I can bring the system into, uh, you know, basically the perfect alignment state of the previous device, and then also on top of that, a double alignment state. So just comparing the Raman between the two devices, we can see that, you know, similarly we get a, an adjustment in the, um, the width of the, of the uh, 2D peak, okay? And so at zero and 60 degree alignment of the top piece, uh, we have the fattest peaks, and then it's some intermediate fatness, uh, full width, uh, some intermediate width. Okay, and then so if I plot the full width half max of both of these as a function of angle on top of each other, we can see uh, sort of an interesting pattern emerge. So at around 15 wave numbers, we have totally misaligned uh, graphene BN, um, you know, BN encapsulated graphene. Uh, when we have one aligned interface, so that's at the maximum uh, full width half max for this data set, uh, that's my baseline in the new device. Okay, so that's just one layer of graphene aligned. But then if I bring the second layer, when I bring the second BN into alignment with the graphene, I get another increase in the 2D full half max. So I guess, you know, when we see this, we ask like, well, you know, did we double the relaxation in some way or did we double the strain? So now, now we're kind of bringing into question whether that, the idea about uh, strain in inhomogeneity is actually a good explanation for this. Um, could be, I mean, so if you have, if you have two, uh, if you've doubled the potential, uh, maybe that's just giving it a little extra oomph to relax even further. Um, okay, so then for the field effect transistor measurement, so here I have, you know, my rotator piece. Uh, when it's completely misaligned, and, you know, when I say completely misaligned, it's between 2 and 58 degrees. Um, the, you know, the, the field sweep looks very similar to what I have, uh, what I've shown previously. And just to highlight, you know, what are we measuring? So we're changing the density, uh, the charge carrier density in the device by sweeping the field. And by sweeping the field, you know, we're basically just sampling uh, different uh, energy slices of this, of this uh, diagram. So at positive carrier density, I'm up here and my carriers are electrons. At negative hole density, my, um, my carriers are holes. And uh, if I want to compute the resistivity of the channel, the 2D resistivity, is just Ohm's law that gives me that. So I send in a current, I measure the voltage drop, and that's, that's what I get. Okay, so if I rotate until I detect alignment, and I actually do that by looking at the friction, I see uh, this very different sweep where now the resistivity of my satellite peak as well as the primary Dirac peak have increased, okay? And if I rotate back, 60 degrees the other way, I get another uh, picture that's slightly different, and it basically looks like a slight reduction of the, um, the, uh, the first alignment state. Okay, so if I continue to push, this is like 200 some odd measurements, it took 36 hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do see uh, periodicity over um, rotations of 120 degrees. Okay, so this is our first hint that, yeah, okay, the, um, you know, whatever is happening in here, the graphene is inheriting the threefold uh, rotational symmetry of the boron nitride as a result of the presence of these super lattices. Okay, so um, the pattern we see is basically strong enhancement over 120 degrees, and that at a phase offset of 60 degrees, we see this sort of reduction. And, you know, the enhancement we get in the uh, primary direct peak and the secondary direct peak is actually slightly different. You can see how sharp these peaks are in for the secondary direct peak. Uh, is that three, four minutes? Three, four minutes? OK. So we can also do thermal activation measurements. So here's just the same picture again uh, as I'm showing here, except it's in connectivity. Uh, and it's around the primary direct point and the, um, the secondary direct point. So as I cool the sample, um, the size of the resistance, or like, you know, the, the um, you know, the conductivity goes down, and that's because I have thermal activation. So if I plot that conductivity as a function of temperature, and then I do Arrhenius fits, um, I can get, uh, you know, at, at two extremes, I have zero and 60 degrees, but I can also get all the intermediate angles. And from this picture, we can see that actually at, you know, at what I'm calling this uh, theta <coughs> top equals zero degrees, I get a very strong enhancement of the uh, thermal activation gap, which is, this is actually kind of, um, uh, you know, in previous reports, we've never seen a gap this big for graphene. So we certainly are, you know, we are, we are doubling something, right? <laughs> and then at, uh, at rotation 60 degrees away, we see a sharp reduction in the gap. So even though there's a resistance peak there, 
um, it's almost as though we are closing the um, closing the gap entirely and approaching a, a protected um, Dirac crossing. Okay, so why could this be the case? Well, you know, to first order, if I'm just looking at a rigid lattice, I can explain this with symmetry. Um, if we just sort of attribute uh, minuses to the nitrogen and pluses to the boron, you can see that in one rotation state, um, I get a doubling of you know, the, the on-site potential from each atom. And then at uh, 60 degrees away from that, then you know, the on-site potential will cancel. Okay. And so that, that could be just, you know, I'm, the degree to which I'm breaking the inversion symmetry of graphene is what's determining uh, the size of the gap. Okay. So what about small angle? So if we go to uh, some uh, top bn rotation angle that's slightly offset, uh, we see another, yet another different profile. Okay, so we still see some enhancement, um, but now it's a little less sharp. And intuitively, we think, okay, I have two, you know, I have a bottom array and I have a top array, and they're sort of maybe closely in, in close proximity. Maybe this at room temperature is a combination of both. So you cool it down, and sure enough, you see two distinct peaks. Okay, and then as you twist the top, uh, the top boron nitride and track the position of the second peak, which you know, therefore should be uh, the top moray, okay, because that's the thing that's changing, it perfectly tracks the dispersion that we were using before um, in previous devices. And you can see that, the, that one of the peaks doesn't move, and um, that is from the bottom moray. Okay. And uh, just, I just want to show you these, um, uh, these temperature versus density maps. So this is basically the same uh, you know, this, this sweep here is just a line cut, horizontal line cut of, cut of this graph. So you can see how that evolves as a function of temperature. So at um, room temperature, you basically have a single peak. Okay, so inside of the density range that you're sweeping, you might only see a single peak because the secondary peak is way off, uh, way outside of your range. And as you bring that secondary peak in, uh, here, you know, maybe they are slightly distinct from each other, but here they're going to be overlapping. But as, as you cool down, um, the peak kind of splits. And our understanding of how that works is, I think, pretty easy to understand. If you are near, you know, let's say you're in, um, you're in this uh, alignment configuration, so you're 0.6 degrees from perfect alignment. Um, at room temperature, your Fermi level sort of broadens, and you're sampling uh, two gaps. Okay, so it kind of just looks like one big resistance blob. And then as you cool down, your Fermi, you know, you know, as I tune my Fermi level uh, up and down, I can sample each individual gap separately. Um, so this is perhaps evidence, or you know, a, a good motivation to to see this as two two, two gaps in close proximity uh, with something in between, maybe a flat band. Okay. So what about the supermoray? So um, uh, just as we were wrapping up our measurements, uh, a group uh, posted a paper about the supermorays. Um, Nice paper with beautiful graphics. And um, their scheme for understanding what the super morays, uh, so the, mor the moray of morays wavelength should be, is you know, just to first order, take the two original morays and then treat those um, as the lattices that are forming your new moray. And so just sort of uh, plug, you know, plug all your values back into the same equation, but now your lattice constants are just the, the moray wavelengths of the original morays. And <coughs> we, so we attempted to follow their model. Um, but I think we were a little unlucky in our, um, maybe in our measurement, because all of the angles that we selected, for some reason, uh, we could not see any features arise. We saw features, you know, you see these other little peaks, but you cannot, you, we could not see features that arose at the location that should be predicted by that for, first order approximation. And it could be that maybe they were just too close to the charge neutrality point, and there's other interference effects that are preventing us from see it, seeing it. Um, but since then, there's been some other papers which have successfully sort of predicted where these, you know, where these peaks should arise. And the way they do it is pretty clever. They, you know, they basically, they model the potential as a function of twist. They do a, you know, um, a Fourier transform and they, they look at uh, what are the harmonics that are important, okay? And they use that to write down the density of states. And as in if, they d if, if uh, we actually had somebody do this for us, um, uh, they actually, you know, what you get very closely agrees with what you measure. And so, you know, just uh, as an approach, I, I think this is preferable to that first order approximation. Unfortunately, it's, it's a little bit more expensive and we, couldn't, we can't do it ourselves. So uh, we would like somebody to write software tools for us to, 
predict more wavelengths and angles of these complicated systems. Okay, so just to summarize, um, we observe this reversible symmetry tuning in this system. Uh, we do see emergent features that indicate coexisting moray super lattices. And we do see the existence of a moray, uh, super moray at small twist, although we haven't fully characterized it and we didn't, um, we didn't have the, this model when we wrote the paper, so it's not, it doesn't appear in the paper. And I'll just quickly thank the co-authors of this paper as well as our predecessors who, who helped us uh, understand how to build this device. And if you're interested in some related reading, these are the papers that have come out so far about um, doubly aligned graphene boron nitride systems. Um, and then just a quick aside, uh, our current capability, we are working on rotating monolayers. Um, so here we have graphene on BN, and I'm, you know, I'm basically using a rotator to sort of slide this large piece around. Uh, the piece is 40 mi microns long. Uh, we can also, and this is also all on the transfer slide, so you can do this while you are, um, before you finish your device. And you can also get a real-time characterization of what the moray is doing at every angle. So this is a um, piezo force microscopy scan. Okay, so recently we just uh, posted a paper on archive. Um, Leo McGilley um, developed this technique for seeing moray super lattices with PFM, and it's a really fast technique that can be done at room temperature, and it's really revolutionized the way we uh, approach building these stacks. And so, you know, you can, you can imagine what, what went into making this animation, but this is an animation of many, F, you know, FFTs of the, of the different scans. So you can study, you know, in these systems uh, how, how the more evolves as a function of twist angle and strain. Thanks.